Hello, dear friends. This is Kardec Radio at 11 p.m. Nourishing our souls with another program, Heal Christ. Heal Christ is here to teach us about ourselves. When you think of yourself, who are you, right? It is important for us to really think about who we truly are. In psychology and in spiritism, we understand that we're much more than we can see in ourselves. But spiritism comes to us to clarify that we are much more. We are divine. So our deep essence is divine. And as we incarnate and reincarnate, we create personalities that will be integrating who we are. It's like expansions of ourselves. But sometimes there is a glitch here and there. And what do I mean by glitch? There are things that are not really aligned with our the best in us. And that's a problem that we need to fix. That's why we get to know about the problems of the ego. Not the personality that we are creating as we incarnate it, but the problems that happen within it when we need to um, create masks to survive and to do things in terms of our daily lives to make sure that we, are, we get what we need. Those egotistic traits need to be polished. In the book, Hail Christ, these are the things that we see. We see those who are very advanced morally, intellectually, and those who are still falling behind. So, when we go to the third book by Ellen Kardec, we come to know that there are different levels in this hierarchy of spirits. There's not like a single way of being. Nobody's created good or evil. Everybody is created perfectible. But what happens? We have levels of evolution. So we have, as Kardec says, in an educational manner, questions 100 to 113 of the Spirit's book. There are imperfect spirits, Good spirits, pure spirits. Jesus at the level of good spirits. On earth, we are still majority, imperfect. But that doesn't mean that something lacks in us. It means that we need to expand. We need to perfect ourselves, refine. It's like a diamond in the rock and we polish and we polish and we polish. And then the diamond comes. That's who we are. In the book of Christ, we're going to see the same. Spirits that are very, 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 very imperfect. To the point of saying, lack true experiences and knowledge, which is evil. Like Helen, the Adelis. And others like Quintus Varus, Livia, Basilius, who are already showing to us the beauty of life at another level. On earth right now, we have the same. As we are in a planet of trials and expiations, we are in this range where we have spirits that are still at the beginning of the level of expeditions and trials, others who are fully immersed in it and some who are already living a way of regeneration. Yes, it's true. There are some who are on earth already experiencing this regeneration because for them daily, good prevails. So where do you think you are in that regard? You think you are closer to the regeneration or to trials and expiations 
when we are closer to regeneration, we like learning, we love serving, we are always trying our best to dream the bad part of us to really accommodate the good. This is what regeneration is all about. We prioritize the good and thus we sacrifice our needs for the needs of others. This is the chapter we're studying in Hail Christ. So welcome, welcome dear friends. I'm just about checking here. Yes, the system is working and I see great friends joining us. So let us reflect at the beginning of this program today. Where do we think we are? Because when we are in trials and expiations, we're still kicking and screaming about the problems in life. We're disappointed that life is not the way we want it. We are frustrated because we wanted something and life is not presenting to us. This is a person who is still full force in this trials and expiations mode. When we are in regeneration, we go through issues, but we can see the brighter side of things like Livia, like Basilius, the first Christians. Did we get it? Yes? This is us learning with them as Emmanuel says in the preface of this book. He says to us, Spiritism calls for brave souls to sacrifice themselves in order to spread the good news victoriously. And he says to us, May the example of these post-apostolic children of the gospel inspire in us today the simplicity and toil, the trust and love with which they renounce themselves in service to the Divine Master. May we as they transform thorns into flowers and stones into bread in the endeavors that the Most High has placed in our hands. What do you think? Hmm? Let us transform stones, thorns into flowers, stones into bread. Right now at Kardec Radio, that's what we're doing together. And we were at a moment in which Basilius and Livia are amongst their Christian friends. Only 20 people, 14 men and 6 women were in the house of a friend of Basilius. His name was Lucanus Vestinus. They are there, they are reading the scriptures, they are feeling enlightened, and they start feeling the presence of the good spirits who are there. You see, mediumship was already practiced in Christianity. Emmanuel shows it to us in this very chapter. He talks about a moment when Lucanus Vestinus, the director, raised his serene face and with traces of happiness and began speaking again. Our sanctuary is being gloriously visited by the with a voice almost choked by tears. Born of the joy that was blooming in his heart, he went on, they are dazzling my eyes with the blessed light enveloping them and then he describes each one of them whom he is seeing and he's describing each one he paused and said that the one of the spirits who used to be a part of the group before opens the fragment of a scroll of light and asked Lucanus to read it out loud to the people. You know, mediumship has many forms. Here we're describing one. He's seen, he's describing. There is a scroll of light 
presented with writings and he, the medium, Lucanus, is reading from what he's seeing spiritually. See, Emmanuel is clear. Mediumship has always existed. It's not an asset of spiritism, not an invention of Allan Kardec. Kardec organized its understanding and brought as a framework that is so unique and safe that would say we should study to practice it safely and to practice wisely. So, he reads, oh, it's Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. And with a voice choked with emotion, he read, In everything we are beset with troubles, but not crushed, perplexed, but not discouraged, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying everywhere the death of Jesus in our body, so that his glorious life may be expressed in us. Our beloved founder is telling us that our time to bear witness is near. He is asking us to be calm, to have courage, to be faithful in love. None of us will be forsaken. Some will have their death postponed, but we shall all drink from the cup of sacrifice. He paused again. They sang together a music in praise of Jesus. And they were silent for a long time, listening to a melody inaccessible to the perception of those who were here. And then when he was adjourning, he said, that he wanted to propose that they met again every night, he says. Let us pray every night for a time. And he can be here. And everybody agreed. So the next morning, so what was interesting here is this. When they finish the meeting, Basilius approaches Lucanus and talks to everybody saying his problem that Livy and him have to have money to pay Helen. But they don't have any money. But Lucana says, if you want, you can live in my house. Don't worry about it. You can give your house for payment and be in my house. True solidarity, huh? True fraternity. The next morning, Basilius talks to Theodolus and tells Theodolus, uh, we can give Helen our house. Theodolus is surprised. He talks to Helen. And Helen has a plot. She says, no problem. No problem. It's a solid way for us to win Tassiana's sympathy for our explanations. We will tell him that the old man was counting our friendship and had come to ask us for more support and had put his house in our care that we did everything we could to save him, but it was useless. And finally, that we'll keep his house without altering anything. And this will be a demonstration of our sincerity and Tassianus will resign himself. So they want to uh, disappear with Basilius and Helen and tell Tassianus that they were so nice, that they kept the house and what can they do, right? They were persecuted because they were Christians. This is Helen, Helen's evil plot. Poor Helen, just creating karma for herself. When Theodolus came back from talking to Helen and told Basilius and Livia that they would agree with it, right? Livia and Basilius were happy. Can you believe it? They're kind of losing their house. They are. And they were happy. They were commenting on how beautiful the sky was. They were talking about the flowers, the sun, the landscape. Such a serene attitude. 
No wonder we're talking about this new attitude that we are all being invited on earth right now. If you watch the news nowadays and, and see what's going on in the world, it, it's very challenging because you start you start immediately feeling because of our mirror neurons. Oh my gosh, this happened to that person. It may happen to me. And then you start feeling like all the symptoms of the coronavirus and the problems. Hold on. Let us together practice something, shall we, friends? Let us practice this joy of living, this calmness. Because if we have to go through anything, by being desperate, we're not helping. I know it's hard because it may be new to us. But look at history. We have gone through so many things. This is not the first or the last challenging time, challenging thing in our lives. Tell yourself you've been through other issues in this life and in previous lives. And here you are. Here I am. We are strong. We're strong enough to go through trusting that God will protect us. And not from the coronavirus, because it's not about choosing who gets it and who doesn't. Of course, none of us want to experience this. But there are many people who experience it, and they survive. They survive. Everybody survives. Some survive in the afterlife. Others in the physical realm. There's no end. And death is not a problem. I know nobody wants to suffer, and that's human. But right now we're learning with Basilius and Livia that there is always a way to find the good in it, to seek the good. Let us, let us together think about it daily. Okay, you and I, I am part of a global current of the good. I decide to seek the good. Keep saying it to yourself during the day. Remember of us here. Because when you do it and I do it, we create a current of light, of healing, connecting to the superior spirits, and we can be used for the benefit of others. Shall we, friends? Yes? Yes. We're not alone. Like these Christians, for the ancient Romans, who were they? Nobody. But look at the beauty on the behind the scenes. How many spirits? 20 people. And when you count, Lucanus describing how many people are visiting. It looked like there were more people. There were more discarnates in the meeting than incarnates. Everywhere it's still like this on earth. So there are good spirits watching over you, watching over me. We're not alone. So let us repeat daily. Thank you, Carol Correa. I am part of a global current of the good. I decide to seek the good. I am part of a global current of the good. I decide to seek the good. And daily, daily, I'm part of a global current of the good and I decide to seek the good in all the situations. Finding the best in everything and everyone and praying. Okay? So... Unfortunately, Helen creates this plot. It's hard. She goes talk to the administrator of Leon. She's friends with them and says, You know, Valerianus, I have proof that there are people who are gathering together in a particular home and they are cherishing this thing of the Nazarenes. And he's like, Don't worry, tonight we're going to go there and put a stop to it. These are my own words, of course, right? And before it all happens, as Lucanus is at that night in the meeting, 
several friends, Basilius and Livia there. They were just praying the last verses of the Lord's Prayer. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever shall be it. When they said it, the soldiers came in. Let's go in. This is the place. The foxes are in their lair. And they are there. Violence. It said they separate the women from the men. They arrest them. But before they arrest, there is a dialogue that in which Lucana says, we don't fear the martyrdom. It's mind-blowing when you read these dialogues because it teaches about this confidence that we may acquire when we're truly cherishing these teachings of the good news deeply in our hearts. It makes us feel deeply courageous, not against anybody, but before life in general, ourselves. We don't doubt anymore the providence of God. It's sad because violence is just uh, falling upon them. They separate the girls, of course, they are going to be raped. Emmanuel describes it. He doesn't use the word rape, but he describes the whole plans of the guards, soldiers, in abusing the girls. But Livia, when, when she separated, she separated, she separated from everybody else. Hold on a second. Basilius, as her father, talks to her one last time. Goodbye, my child. I do not think we'll see each other again in this mortal life. But I shall wait for you in eternity. If you are delayed on earth, do not feel that you are far from my footsteps. We'll be together in spirit, only the flesh lives in the shadow of the tomb. If you are abused, forgive. I will repeat it, because this is strong. A father who loves her child and says, if you are abused, forgive. This is really different, because to date, people wouldn't understand this advice. Food for thought. The progress of the world is achieved through the sweat of those who suffer. Let's listen to this, huh? The progress of the world is achieved through the sweat of those who suffer. And human justice is a shrine raised by the pain of the conquered. Do not be dismayed and do not think that you are being forsaken. One day we'll meet again in the home that has neither tears nor death. But let us observe one thing here. He says that the progress of the world is achieved through the sweat of those who suffer. Point. Period. Think. Together. How are we going to transform the world? By stepping forward courageously into doing the things that are in need to be done. They will be new, innovative, different, sometimes awkward to the world. But if we don't suffer that first impact of being a forerunner, a trainer, trailblazer, we won't help the world. If you are a spiritist, remember, in 2020, those who are spiritists are few in the world. If there is one thing we know for sure, 
we are the first waves of spiritists in planet Earth. That means that the world is awaiting our dispositions to follow through. What do you think about this? Does it make us feel more responsible, more diligent, more devoted? We as a group on earth right now, we have high responsibilities. The responsibility of carrying out the torch of the light, of the good news, in its fullness. No dogmas, no misunderstandings. Complete, it's pure. So friends, the responsibility mounts. We need to apply ourselves in greater studies, and especially, I will use Emmanuel's word, in Basilia's life when he said the progress of the world is achieved through the sweat of those who suffer. Sweat. So it is labor intensive. It is full of effort and it will make us cry. Why? Because it's new. People won't get it yet, but we need to do it. It's not about words. It's about attitude. It's about that feeling when people look and say, that person is different. Something is different. And we await. One day we meet again. People come and say, I have a problem. And you say, I can help you. And they say, oh, that's why I thought you were different, because you knew of this. Yes, now I want to share with you, and you can do the same to others. And we pass the torch, and people keep passing the torch until the world gets to know of it. It doesn't matter the name. It's about the truth. Today I saw a beautiful post by Nora Brasil with a beautiful picture of the Spiritist books in the form of a heart she followed through. And I said, you know, it's so beautiful, Nora, that you, you, you had this beautiful post on your Facebook sharing with people the treasure that you have in your hands. For those who don't know, it may be a teaser. For those who are suffering, it may be the very remedy that they need. Good job. Good job. We need more of this. Yes, Lara. Responsibility and labor intensive. Yes, thank you for writing it down, reinforcing it for us. Thank you. So, of course, some go to prison. The girls go to a separate room. But Livia, oh, sweet Livia, there's always something about her, right? There's always something about her. She is asked to be in Valeriana's, in, a, in a, one of his offices. Remember, Valeriana's is the very administrator of the Roman Empire in that city. And he's married to Clymen, who is friends with Helen. And Helen did everything she could to get rid of Livia because she's jealous of Tassianus and Livia. And go figure. Livia ends up there and Valerianus falls in love with Livia. He doesn't abuse her. He tries to convince her passionately to surrender to his whims. She's crying and saying, I'm sorry, but I can't. And he waits for days. Now everybody's talking about it. His servants and, of course, his wife got to know. One day, Valerianus is in that office trying to convince Livia of what 
he wants to do with her, but he doesn't want to force her into this. And climbing, the wife is overhearing the conversation. What's happening? And she hears the whole conversation. He talks about her. She says, you know, my wife and I are nothing. We're not at peace any longer. But you, you're the dream of my life. I can give you everything. You'll be my wife. I will give you my whole world, etc. And she's grateful, but she says, I can't. And in spite of her cries, her sobbing, her resistance, Climin, who is overhearing it, is furious. Not necessarily with her husband, but she's furious with the woman. She's so jealous. What does she do? She runs, talking with Helen, not knowing that Helen knows who Livia is. Mamma mia. Poor Livia. From the get-go, remember when she was abandoned as a baby? And then her whole life, bumpy, 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 bumpy road. It's a bumpy road for her. She marries with a guy who's a gambler. She meets the love of her life who can't be with her, though he wants to, but it's not the right way of doing things. And then now, Helen gets to know, and Helen has a terrible idea. She says, I'll read it to you. She says this. Okay. Kaimin was jealous. And she talked to Olivia. And Olivia said, with fel feline eyes gleaming cruelly, she said with a smile, We used to have a trustworthy friend in Rome. Her name was Sabiniana Portia. She had dedicated herself to our family ever since my father's boyhood. Sabiniana was married to Belisarius Dorian, who never resigned himself to have just, in one, just one woman. Well, this restless husband began to extol the beauty of Ulysses' teeth. She was a Greek slave whose physical endowments had help, hopelessly attracted him. Our friend calmly listened to his ardent remarks, and at dinner the next day, a round silver tray appeared with her beautiful teeth on it. Sabiniana reasoned that if her teeth were the cause of his passion, the least she could do was to serve them to her husband. This is the level of cruelty at the times. And she proposes... If your husband Valerianus loves Livia's eyes, let's make her blind. She calls, Clymen calls her servant, Synesia, and says, I want you to do this. You're going to make her fall asleep with this potion, and while she's sleeping, you're going to put something in her eyes she'll never see again. Sinesa did it the next day. Livia was blind. It's mind-blowing what Emmanuel is describing to us. It's so graphic. So full of cruelty, right? Why is Emmanuel showing it to us? Again, to help us observe our shadows. This is us, not very long ago. And thus, the reasons why we're still here on earth. To overcome our jealousies, our spite, our envy. All these stories are full of pride, selfishness, and envy, jealousy. We're not able to see the beauty in others and their progresses 
without feeling like, why not me? And we have to do the same or put that person aside. This is just like Helen. Maybe today in this life, we don't kill anybody. We don't make them go blind. We don't displace them from their homes. But we may create obstacles for their good works to reach higher ranks because it's not us. And then we're jealous. So we need to observe in this chapter our shadows. Jealousy is big in this. Big, 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 big. Jealous. If I don't have it, then spite. They can't have it either. And then this need to be center in people's lives. Let us meditate on this as Emmanuel is inviting us to cleanse the heart. And if you ask, but how do I tame this jealousy, Vanessa? Sister Shayla has a message that is so beautiful. Bless always. And she says, when we start blessing everything and everyone, life transforms. So when you see somebody who is doing beautiful works and you feel like that peak of jealousy, quickly breathe in and out and say, God bless you. God bless you. Keep on going. Keep on going. God bless you. You are my brother, my sister, and I rejoice with you. Even if you don't say it to them, say it to yourself and throw these words in the wind of life to them. Bless their achievements because their achievements connect to us as well. Everyone who is succeeding is bringing humanity up. We should cheer up. When we see people, instead of like, or spite when we ignore people. They're doing great and we pretend we're not seeing it. Right? So, of course, Libya's life now is terrible. Plus, there is something that we want to talk about. Basilius. Basilius is in a torture room with other men. And he's being tortured as well. He's being tortured. They are tying themselves and pulling them apart. Emmanuel describes in details even when his eyes pop out. But what is beautiful here is what he teaches us. Nomitius aides tied both old men to two large wooden horses and bound their arms and legs with rough leather cords that stretched their bodies to the point of pulling their bones out of joint. Lucanus calls the whole group to cheer them up, saying, do not grieve for us. Grief and despair are not part of the master traced out for us. You see? Grief and despair. So when people say, oh, I'm grieving because I miss my old life, when we're truly aligned, we don't grieve anything. We're always seeking the good. There must be something good in the times we're living in. We need to seek it. And despair, no to despair. And then they are there, Basilius and Lucanus, being tortured. And at some point, the last cry of Basilius is Jesus. Remember, Emmanuel, who is writing, is talking about his very incarnation as Basilius. He dies in that life, crying out the name of Jesus. 
He is absorbing it. The death came quickly, he says. But he ascends so quickly that from there on, he is helping Livia. You see, Livia now is sent to freedom in the plot. Theodolus fakes being a friendly hand, brings Livia to a trip, though she's blind, and says, I'm going to bring you to a new life. And she believes in him. She can't see anything. But you know what? She happily agreed with Theodolus in everything. When they reach a certain place, Theodolus says, wait for me here. There is like a, a big plaza, people, a market. And he says, sit down here at the bench. I'll be back. She waits. She believes in him. He never comes back. What does she think? First thing, she was alone in Sicily. Remember, Rome, Lyon, and now back all the way down in Sicily. And she says to herself, why had she come into the world with such a destiny? She wandered in torment. And then she starts thinking about the mother who abandoned her when she was a newborn. And then again, she's abandoned. But she realized that the future needed her to recompose herself. So she gave thanks to God because she could weep freely. And even though she was separated from Basilius, she could feel his immense love. She remembered the teachings that she heard at last. And as the tears were running down her face against the evening wind, she said a prayer to God. Dear Father, please do not abandon me. Remember the day when you pulled me from that path. And shelter me again in your love. I'm foundly once again. I do not know why this adverse fate is waiting on my soul. But I believe, as you taught me, that Jesus watches over us from heaven. Now that I'm shattered and blind, please do not let me lose the inner light of hope. Help me regain my spirits. You often told me that suffering purifies us and lifts us up to God. Enable me to understand this reality more powerfully so that sorrow cannot lead me to the brink of rebelliousness. You always told me that our life doesn't end with death. That our soul rises to the heights of eternity where peace reigns. You believe that the dead are more alive than people wrapped in flesh. And you also believe that our loved ones beyond the grave can help and protect us. How then could I forget you, who were my continual friend and the benefactor of all my days? How happy I would have been to have followed your footsteps. But I could not enjoy the privilege of dying for Jesus in the torture of the arena. Oh, Father, why wasn't I granted the grace to go with our friends? Why did fate separate me from my fellow believers who were blessed with martyrdom? Have mercy on me. Explain life to me like you used to. Guide me through this labyrinth. Remember that I'm still just a child in the darkness of human wilderness and be my garden again. I was brought here with the promise of being reunited with my friends but I don't know where they are. I will probably never clasp their hands again in this world. On earth, separation is always colder because of the barriers that keep us from seeing our loved ones. 
But in the spirit world, the heart must have different resources to strengthen and rescue love. Livia wanted to shout the words. But the pedestrians passing by didn't want to hear it, of course. She was still weeping in prayer when, like uh, in a miraculous dream, she saw a light filled pathway appear in the darkness, obscuring her sight. And on it, she saw Basilius coming to meet her. He says to her, Daughter, like Jesus himself, his followers know loneliness but never abandonment. Do not lament the fog in which heaven is testing your faith. The stars shine brightest on the darkest nights. Our hopes shine with greatest intensity in the winter of greatest suffering. Take heart and believe in the exalted power of our Father. Indeed, we did go before you on the inevitable journey of the tomb. And he keeps on telling her things. So dedicate yourself to the good fight, calmly and fearlessly. We will be with you, guiding you along the thorn strewn away. He tenderly embraced his daughter and she returned the gesture. She felt more encouraged. Night has fallen. And then he said, don't be afraid. Help will not be long in coming. You'll soon be rescued. Do not bar kindness or trust from your heart so that the Lord will have no difficulty in keeping you. Blindness of the eyes does not mean useless of the soul. Remember our arduous poverty was the music our reason for living. And just then, Livia heard a child's voice singing. And he, she started talking to this boy who is just seven years old, named Celsius. You know who he is? Quintus Barras reincarnated. Oh my gosh, we're going to stop here because in this beautiful arrangement, hope is lifted up. She raised herself in prayers, but the prayer that is true surrender. How do you often pray? Demanding things? Expressing crazy demands, petitions, or surrendering yourself to God, knowing that for everything there is a reason. She surrendered. Her father came talking to her and almost like led her into the next phase. He gave her the tip. Remember, music always. She started hearing a boy singing. His name is Celsius. She starts talking to him. He says he's there singing for money because his mother is so ill. ill. She has tuberculosis. Livia knows of the family. They become friends. Though they live in a shack, one room house, they invite Livia in. From there on, there is a new life for Livia. Right now, we're here in the world being challenged in so many ways. And we may feel blind like Livia. We cannot see an inch ahead of us because we don't understand what's going on in the world. But do we need to know? Or what if we thought we knew? Only God knows. It's an illusion. Now we are experiencing what we should experience every day. Because the illusions we create in our lives seem certainties that are not real. 
right now, life is saying, I'm going to teach you to believe in God and only God. Because everything else is just an illusion. Livia learned, little by little, to deepen her faith. She's gaining new levels of faith. So are we. In the next 24 hours, let us practice this exercise. Saying this affirmation to us right here and now. I am part of a global current of the good. I decide to seek the good and find the best in everything and everyone. Let us feel connected and we are forming this current of support, connecting with other people and making sure that we have one only certainty that God provides to us. God loves us and provides to us everything we need. Shall we do this, friends? Yes? So let us pray. Let me see where is the earthly globe. Somewhere I can find it. Maybe Virginia got it. <laughs> but let us visualize our beautiful planet here in our hands. Hold our planet Earth. With your loving care, bring it to your heart. Let us visualize this beautiful planet being enveloped by rays of healing light. Let us breathe in. This healing and visualizing people feeling calmer, people feeling hopeful, people healing. The rate of healing is expediting and we see it by the minute and people becoming more faithful and fraternal. Dear God, so many lessons because in the current epidemic that became a pandemic, we are like we've never been before. The fear comes out of much consciousness we have acquired. But we don't want to give in to it because we believe in you. We trust you. We know that you've created us for beautiful purposes. And knowing how humbling this situation is for all of us, we kindly ask you to strengthen us physically, spiritually, emotionally. Strengthen humanity on earth. We pray tonight specially for healing energies to all who are sick in the world. We pray for each household, for the leaders of the world, for their need, for support. May they feel your loving support. May they feel your loving embrace. We're letting out of unneeded energies. Substituting thoughts that are no longer needed. By feelings of gratitude, loving kindness. True brotherhood on earth. And may we hear in this current of love whether live or on demand, be sustained daily in this volunteer service that we shall do, repeating to ourselves that we are part of this global current of 
healing of the good. And we are committed to seeking the good. Feeling your loving embrace, feeling your kindness. We thank you for the opportunity of being here together and for the spirit mentors, doctors, nurses, and therapists who have been visiting all of us to strengthen us. And so be it. Yes, Melissa. It's a light of inner hope. This is our chapter today, Hail Christ, bringing to us the best in us. Here at Kardec Radio, always nourishing our souls. A big hug to you. Lots of love. Lots of healing. And until tomorrow, God willing, friends.